Good Thursday morning to all of you who are joining us live and uh, for all of you who are joining us later, we welcome you as well. Uh, good morning to each one of you and I pray that this beautiful fall day is beautiful where you are here in South Carolina. The trees are just starting to um, turn golden and a little bit of red and orange uh, and they're just beautiful. I just took a look out front when I took our doggy out this morning, uh, I'm sorry, out back and looked at that beautiful big tree in the back and it's just glorious. And um, only God can do that, uh, to clothe his creation in all the different colors of all the different seasons. Uh, he's wonderful. And, um, and so I pray that you take this time, um, this moderate weather uh, that comes with uh, fall to do some of the things that just feel right and good during that, that season that people call it sweater weather. And it's really true. It's not too hot, not too cold, just enough to slip on a sweater. It's a great time to take a walk and commune with the Lord that way. You just love him and look at everything that he's done in the uh, in creation and in your neighborhood. And you might meet somebody along the way or to um, just sit on your front porch or your back porch or your deck with a steaming cup of coffee or tea or hot chocolate and just enjoy Breathe in that crisp air. It's it's just a wonderful time of year. So don't miss it. Uh, and I'm talking to myself. Don't miss it. It's it's a beautiful uh, opportunity to praise the Lord as we take in what he's done. Because some of you, what's ahead for you is a big winter. Not so much down south, but um, where where I grew up in Northern Virginia, we, we would have the fall weather, which was beautiful. But we knew that pretty tough winter conditions were coming. And so we tried to really enjoy that, that, that moderation of too, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, so I just wanna encourage you to do that. We wanna continue our uh, sharing with Psalm 1. Um, as we learned last week, um, uh, King David, as he wrote this Psalm and God says it to us, since he breathed all of these words um, in, um, in the Bible, he said, you're blessed if you do if you do not do three three things. In other words, a blessed man, and that means one in right standing, righteous in God's sight because of Jesus. For those of us from the New Testament, you don't sit, stand, or walk in the way of the world. In other words, you don't sit. Or, you don't sit in the seat of the scornful with that attitude. You don't walk. You don't feel comfortable. Um, in the way of the world, the world system, the way the world thinks about anything. That's not what God called us to be. So that's what he said, don't do. And he was very clear about it. And I like that. Then he said, but but do this. Um, and last week we talked about um, what he said to do, and that's to, to be diligent in his law, not in the 10 commandments, but in all of God's law, all of his words and to meditate on them day and night. So here's the conditional thing. You're blessed. Stay away from that. If you want to be blessed, there's three things I'm telling you don't do. But if you want to be blessed, then do these things. And so we talked about that and, you know, staying in God's word and what that means. But now the question is, well, what are the blessings when we do that? And that's what we want to talk about today. The wonderful, really staggering blessings of Psalm 1 when we obey the Lord and do those things. So what are the blessings? Well, verse 3 tells us the first one, and I'm going to read this. Um, he shall be, that means the, the man who is blessed, who has delighted themselves in the law of the Lord, who has meditated on those day and night. That person, that righteous man, that person will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And that, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've read that verse and I knew that verse. And, you know, I sort of thought I, I knew what it meant, but there's, it's just so full of wondrous things that God wants to share with us. So we're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of of water. And it's not a wild tree. Like when I go out in our backyard, uh, 
there's lots of trees. I don't know how they got there, whether they blew in or or whatever. Or you can go in a woods and you can just see thousands of trees, just wild trees growing. But some trees are planted like the one in our side yard that got struck by lightning a number of years ago and we had to replant it. But when I read the scripture though, who I thought about was my daddy. Uh, we, uh, there was a, a tree in our front yard that died and daddy planted a weeping willow. And that was, he loved that tree. And as far as I know and can remember, I'm not trying to lie, but I don't know if I'm exactly accurate, but I can't remember any other weeping willow tree in that area where we lived in Loch Lomond. I can't remember any, but daddy wanted a weeping willow. And so he planted it. And of course it was just really small, but I remember he, he drove stakes in the ground and he took um, rope and tied it around it to make sure that the wind and the rain and the blowing wouldn't blow it over, but also just to keep it steady so it would go straight. And he took great pride in that tree. And we have pictures of my baby sister, who I was like 17 when she was born, but when she was born, uh, sitting up in the in that tree uh, and in, in the uh, lower branches. And, and that beautiful, you know how a weeping willow has that soft, soft look and when the wind blows it just blows like that and it's, it's just gorgeous and but my dad planted it you see so it's different than just a wild weeping willow that you saw on the side of the road or in the woods it's not the same thing and what this means is that we are pl a planted tree we are chosen we're considered property so that was on our property just like this tree out to the back rather to the side of our house that's on my daughter and son-in-law's property. It belongs to them. They planted it and John made sure it grew correctly. The same thing with the weeping willow. It had purpose and design and it was cared for and it was watered and it was protected, <coughs> excuse me, against the wind and the rain and the snow and the blowing and, and all of those things. And isn't it beautiful that the Bible says, we'll be like a tree planted. Well, who, who would plant us? other than God himself. And somewhere else in the Old Testament, I forgot to look it up, but it says that we are the planting of the Lord. And that's such a wonderful concept to understand that we're not just a tree. We're a tree that's been planted by him. And he chose the place of planting. He decided where we were going to be planted. And that was by the rivers of water. The rivers of water. Isn't that beautiful that he didn't say uh, just a river, but rivers, multiple rivers, multiple stations for us to be nourished. When I read this too, I asked myself, hmm, what is my source? Do I need help a lot in my walk? Am I constantly stumbling and needing someone to pick me up and replant me or get my roots down. Well, I know, Vicky, your roots are sticking out again now. You're not, you're not, those roots are not in the water. If so, I need to check my source to make sure that I have stayed in the source where God planted me. And he planted me beside enough to sustain me, enough rivers. You think if one river dried up and you know, I forget where it is now, but they have found this, um, this river, this, uh, reservoir that has dried up and they're finding human skeleton remains of those that have either fallen in there or put in there or whatever. And you think that could happen, you know, as the, as it dries up, who knows what's at the bottom. But, but God says, I've planted you beside rivers. There's never going to be an end. I will be the source of those rivers. When I think of rivers or I think of, um, I think of, uh, uh, movement and life and what's in them. And I, I don't just see a river just laying flat, but I always see a movement like over the rocks and, and between the banks or even a brook or a stream. They call it babbling, uh, a babbling brook. So it, it makes sounds and so does a mighty river. They make a, a sound. And if you get close to it, that's about all you can hear is the power of that, the life that's in that, that flowing water. And God says, that's where I'm planting you besides those kinds of rivers, not just one, but many. So um, let's think about what kind of rivers there are 
um, in God that's that is um, available for us to be a source in our walk with the Lord so that we can be blessed. What blessings are in these rivers? Well, the first one could be the rivers of pardon. Pardon is such a, a beautiful concept, a beautiful truth, and a beautiful word. It is the removal of guilt. It means that punishment is due, but it's not in, inflicted. You do the punishment, but it was not inflicted. That's pardon. If you get a pardon from prison, it means you were uh, you were adjudicated to be guilty of something, but someone with authority to give you the pardon says you are being pardoned, which means you are no longer in jeopardy. It means your bill has been paid. It means the price has been adjudicated for you by my authority. So the rivers of pardon come to even those of us that are believers. Sometimes we think of these words um, uh, like pardons, and I'm going to talk in a, a little bit about repentance. We think of those as being applied to those that are um, not believers. But that's not true. And that's not really what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that as we walk with the Lord, we need pardon. We don't just receive him, become a Christian, and we no longer have any challenges in our life. There are times when we deserve something, but God pardons us. In uh, Isaiah, he says this, thou cast all my sins behind thy back. It's a beautiful uh, picture of what God does in pardon. The sins are uh, the the recompense, so to speak, of our sins are due, but God puts them behind His back as we as we as believers in the New Testament seek forgiveness, um, and um, and restoration of our relationship. It's the picture of the young man that decided he knew better than Daddy, and he wanted all his money uh, that Daddy had for him, and the father, being uh, full of love and compassion for his son. Uh, let him have all of what what he was due. And you know the story. He went out and spent it all and uh, fell into terrible sin and ended up um, into slavery in that faraway country. But the picture of pardon is when he finally came to himself, the Bible says, and was on his way back. He thought even the servants are having a better life than I. I know I can't ever be a son again, but I can at least beg to be a servant and have some food to eat. I'm starving and a place to sleep. So that's what was in his mind. But pardon came with a kiss, with a father running into his arms, with a uh, a robe, a, a, a robe, a clean robe over his dirty, filthy clothes and a signet ring of familial connection put on that filthy hand and shoes because, you know, in those days, if you were shoeless, that meant you were a slave. But shoes were put on and pardon was given. It is a it is a perfect picture of God's pardon to us. And when we come home to the Father, um, it's been established. Uh, that relationship was established immediately again, as soon as repentance uh, came into that child's heart. Uh, when we uh, receive pardon, we're able to look into God's face and say, you are my God, my God. And the relationship has been restored. So that river of pardon for a righteous man that is in God's word and that delights in it, and that takes, takes it in and massages it into his life every day and every night, that man is blessed. And that man whose relationship is restored has rivers of pardon over and over and over again. Can you hear that? Can you hear the river? Can you hear the river in your heart that it's flowing? That's from God. And he says, it's, it's all, it will always be there for you, for you, for the, for the man who decides and the world, the woman for us in our sake, who decides to do this. And um, it will, it will never uh, dry up because there'll be another river and there'll be another river rivers of water. The other river is rivers of grace. In um, yeah, Hosea 14, um, the Israelites had been bad, you know, disobeying and grumbling and all those things. And God had turned his back and, um, and said all of these things. And then in verse 14, he said, 
I will, I will love them freely. What a beautiful phrase that is freely, openly, once they, once they turn again to me. God said, I, the great Jehovah God, who requires you to be holy in my sight, I will love them freely. We can take that for our own. <clears throat> it's the picture of grace. I, when I was growing up in the Lord, I learned the acronym G-R-A-C-E. Uh, it helped me to remember what grace was as I was learning the scripture and learning the walk, uh, learning how to serve the Lord. And that's G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That helped me to understand, oh, I get God's forgiveness and his riches, but Jesus paid the price um, because we don't have any merit to, to d- deserve grace. That's not something that we can buy. You can't, even if you could, there would be no money available anywhere that could ever purchase God's grace. But God said, we have rivers. You have access to rivers of grace in your life. God's love to us all, whether we're um, sinful and unworthy, whether we're growing in the Lord, whether we're mature Christians, it's the same. God's grace comes from him and we have nothing to do with it. We just can receive it. It doesn't wait for us. It seeks us out because we can't come to God on our own. He speaks to our heart. He draws us by conviction of sin to himself. So it all starts with him and it all ends with him. So the rivers of grace, can you hear them? I can hear the sound of the rivers of grace to that man that chooses that. That's one of the blessings, the blessings of the rivers of pardon, of the rivers of life and the rivers of grace spontaneous. It always starts with God. Always. His love always comes first. His pardon comes as we receive it and his grace comes first. He wills it and then it is done. And then there are rivers of promise. This is an inexhaustible wealth. Have you ever thought, oh, I wish I was, I wish I was rich. I think we've all maybe thought of that. I sure have. And you sort of daydreamed about what you would do and who you would give the money to and what you would have spent it on. And, and, you know, just that um, release of never having to look at a price tag. I can't even think of that, but I want to tell you and be happy to tell you and remind myself that we are so rich that we have inexhaustible wealth in the rivers of God's promises. God's promises can be offensive and defensive weapons. I can remember when um, Christine, when she was really little, she, um, I forget what she did, but um, later, I think it was maybe even the next day or that night, she said, mom, you said you were going to give me, maybe we were out or whatever. You said you were going to spank me for that, but you forgot and you didn't do it. And so (laughs) she told me. And so that was like, um, oh, um, That was an offensive and a defensive, uh, that promise that I had made her. I promise you, you're going to get spanked. And then I forgot. Uh, And so she, in her honesty, told me. And of course, at that time, I remember being flat footed, thinking, oh, you know, it's all past. And and so I don't think I did spank her. I think I explained that I forgot and that this this is what had happened. And she did. But she was going to receive some Um, some grace right then. And I was able to to give her the grace that God gives. Whether she deserved it or not, uh, I was able to show her what grace felt like. I don't know whether I explained that to her. I hope I did. Uh, But I can remember so well laughing to myself saying, man, I I had to be reminded of my promise. Just not of a good promise, but a a promise to spank her. She was always very um, honest that way. And she continues to, to be that way. But God's promises are so precious and they're rivers of them. I want you to get the idea in your mind. The blessings of Psalm 1 are rivers of water, rivers of pardon, rivers of grace, rivers of promises. They're like an ointment to a wound. Have you ever felt wounded? Something has happened and you, you open God's word or you're reminded of a promise and it's like somebody put an ointment over the wound and you're able to breathe in and place that like, so to speak, in your spirit to say, God said this, even though I feel hurt. Have you ever had your heart broken? 
God's promises are a remedy to that. That's the river going by. You can just access it because it's right there. His promise, his promises are right there like a river, deep and wide and rushing, and they're filled with life. And they remedy a heartbreak. This is what Charles Spurgeon, who you know is my favorite, said. He likens the promises of God to, quote, a heavenly pharmacy, unquote. And when I read that, oh, I'm going to come back to it in just a minute. When I read that, it made me start thinking, and I'm going to tell you what it made me start thinking about and what the Lord dropped in my heart. Uh, and actually, it was when I was driving, um, I, I started thinking about a pharmacy, a heavenly pharmacy, God's promises. And then I'll tell you what came to me. But I want to finish this. Um, God's promises spring from our Father who keeps all covenants. So it's a surety thing. You don't have to think about it or wonder or uh, prove it because God cannot lie. He said, I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. That's a promise. And we don't have to ask about it. We know it's written in, the, in, in our hearts and from the heart of God. So wh what's important for us is to know the promises of God. If there's a river of promises, but we don't know the river of promises, then when it comes to the time to need them as an offensive or defensive weapon or to heal a heartbreak or give us courage or encouragement, we're, we're lost. So it's expedient and incumbent upon us to know the promises of God. That's what the Bible said earlier. I want you to delight in my word. I want you to know my word and massage it and meditate on it day and night. So you know the promises. So when those things come, the promises are right there. Don't let the river go by you and not have access to it because he will never fail. They will never fail. Um, Isaiah 54, 5, uh, when I first became a widow, um, I, my, my mind went to this verse that says, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts, is his name. And I remember saying, well, God, I know you promised that, but I don't understand. I mean, I don't understand how you can be my husband. A and so what I did is I said, show me, show me how this promise works. I trust you. I believe you, but I just don't see. Well, as the, as the days and the weeks and now the many years have passed, I understand so well the promises of God. My questions Instead of taking them to Gary and speaking with him, I took them to my maker, my father, who said he would be my husband. Um, the love that I missed so much, the communion that I missed so much, he took the place of that. Um, the guide, Gary was so wise and so smart. Um, and he guided so much of my how I thought, how I changed. The Lord became that to me and the comfort that I needed so many times um, as I wept in my pillow in the early days and just the loneliness and sometimes the desire for comfort that still comes. God is there. He said he would be, and that's where he is um, to direct my steps and to protect me. Um, many times I've cried out to God, Lord, protect me. Don't let me make a wrong move. In other words, I want to make sure that I um, I follow exactly the steps that you want me to follow. I feel a little bit um, uneasy or a little bit confused right now. And um, sometimes I ask my, my our daughter, sometimes I call our son and talk to him. Sometimes I talk to our son-in-law um, and ask him too, to help to guide me and protect me. But the bottom line is that God has said, I'll take it over. I promise I will guide you. I will protect you. I will comfort you. I will be with you. I will love you. And I will direct your, your paths, Vicki, because I promised that I would. That's the river of promise. So that one, just that one scripture that, that the Lord took me to <clears throat> that I didn't understand, and then he gently said, just wait and just prove me. I was able to do that. And I wanted to share that because you might be listening, saying, well, I know God promised this. This is the one promise I know, but I don't see anything. And so I don't understand. Tell them that you don't understand. Say, Lord, I want to prove this. And now I'm going to step out in faith and believe your promises. 
I'm not going to fuss about it anymore. I'm just going to wait and see you reveal your promises to me. And now I want to go back in my closing few minutes and talk about what the Lord showed me, this incredible picture of the heavenly pharmacy that Spurgeon called God's promises. Um, and I thought about that. I went, I thought, and I had to write it down because sometimes in my exuberance, um, I just don't get all the things that, <laughs> that I want to say and that the Lord gave me. But I thought, a heavenly pharmacy. So I put it in the natural first and I could see us walking into a natural pharmacy and it would be stocked full of everything that a pharmacy has. Can you imagine being able to walk in there and every ointment, every elixir, every cough medicine, every vitamin, every analgesic to help with pain, every um, uh, one of those real fancy ones that are extremely expensive that help with cancer treatments and on and on and on, even eyeglasses and knee pads and crutches, all of those things are in a pharmacy. So can you imagine going in there and taking whatever we wanted, whatever we needed, and never having to ask any questions of the pharmacist, but being able to take whatever we needed and just walk out in order to enrich our lives. Well, that's what the heavenly pharmacy is. That's what God's promises are. It's the exact picture of that as I looked at that. And yeah, we walk into the heavenly pharmacy and it is filled to overflowing. And there's never going to run out. You'll never get a text message saying, um, we've had to order this. Uh, I've gotten that before, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, we know that you called in a refill, but we're out of that, or we can only give you four and you'll have to come back. God's pharmacy, his, his promises, you'll never have that. As we walk into that heavenly pharmacy, they will never run out. They will never have to order a refill. God will never have to say, you know, could you hold off on that? Because I ran out of that and I need to get some more. No, he's everlasting. Um, there's no refills needed because they last forever. You don't have to get a refill and you don't have to take them with water either. You take them into your spirit. Um, they work for anyone that you don't have to give any um, pr uh, previous uh, health information or even spiritual information. If you're a brand new Christian or if you've been saved for 60 years like me, the promises are the same. It's a one size fits all as far as that. Now we have to follow instructions. Just like in a, a, a regular pharmaceutical, you look at it and it says what to do. Take twice a day with meals or uh, take once a day um, in the morning. Uh, we follow the instructions. Well, God's promises are the same. Many of his promises are conditional. He says, this is, this is how to get there. Even this says, if you want to be blessed, if you want to be like a tree planted by the water, here's what I've told you to do. Don't do this, this, and this, but start with this. So you see that conditional. And when we do that, when we follow the instructions in the beautiful pharmacy that we're in right now of God's promises, then we're able, then what, whatever we receive into our spirit does what it's supposed to do. Um, there's no, um, <clears throat> There's no adverse effects. Just recently, I decided not to take something that had been prescribed for me because I read what could happen. And I went, you know what? <laughs> I'll deal with what's going on because the adverse effects were innumerable and they got worse as you got older. And I thought, no, this is not the thing. Guess what? God's promises, there are no adverse effects or contraindications. You know what that says? Uh, you need to check with your doctor if you're taking this, because this could contraindicate you taking what I'm prescribing for you now. And many times we had to advocate that ourselves because the doctors aren't keeping up exactly with everything that we're taking. Well, God knows exactly what we're taking. And there are no contraindications on the pharmacy in God's heart of his promises that he made to his people, to Israel and to his children born of the through the blood of his only son. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's no language barrier. You don't have to speak a certain language in order to receive and go to that. Can you just see it? I hope you can see the picture of the heavenly pharmacy where we pull out 
exactly what we need. And it doesn't have to be explained to us. Uh, it's in every language. God's grace and his mercy and his pardon and his promises are in every language. Each one is clearly marked. There's no way to overdose. You can't take too much. You can't get too many of God's promises where you're choking or, wow, you know, she died of an overdose. You know, she just had way too many promises. <laughs> no, that will never happen. And so um, while, uh, while Mr. Spurgeon didn't go through any of this, my crazy brain as I was driving, I started thinking about that, a heavenly pharmacy. And there's no expiration date. I, I was jot, jotting these down. There's no expiration date. They never lose their potency. It's like you can take that, that one promise that you may be like your promise that you just hold on to. It's the, it's the same. It's efficacious when God breathed it, when he promised it, and it is today, thousands of years later. And in a thousand years, it'll still be the same. It never loses its potency. That's the river of God's promises that we can access as we are blessed. Can you imagine these blessings? These blessings were to me, were just staggering. Um, <clears throat> they will never be recalled. And here's the best part. They are free. In, in our pharmacy here on earth, we go in there and sometimes we swallow when we see how much it costs. Many of us are, are fortunate to have some help with insurance but even with insurance, you pay for what is prescribed to help you. Well, you don't pay because it's already been paid. Jesus already paid for the promises of God to us. So those are just, I didn't even finish uh, the rivers yet. But I pray that you were able to hold on to that, that God planted you on his property beside his rivers and his rivers of grace, his rivers of pardon, his rivers of promise. And we're going to finish the um, the last river and the rest of the verses next week. But I pray that you hear. Can you hear the sound of the rivers? Can you hear the power of the rivers and what they say? Can you hear the babbling brook? Can you see the life that's in that, the water? Can you know that you that God has put you there? You're his property. You were chosen. And he's the one who planted you and me beside these rivers of water, rivers of life. And these are incredible blessings that he's opened up to us that the Psalms talks about. The Psalm talks about. I'm so grateful. And I pray that you have been encouraged. And next week when we come back, we're going to go to the last river and, uh, and try to finish up the Psalm. Uh, thank you for listening today, and I pray that you are encouraged and blessed. And if you don't know some of the promises of God, find out. They're right there in, in the Word, um, in the Old Testament and, and in the New Testament, His promises. And if they're conditional, find out what the condition is, because that's important. Uh, many times we just snip it out, something that feels good to us, but don't read all of it. But God's promises are precious because they're from Him, and He paid for all of those so that they're free to us and they're free to us through his son, Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, um, for these incredible blessings that come from your hand. Thank you so much for the rivers of life um, that you have planted us beside so that we are not without source. You are the source and you decided this. And so we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for these wonderful rivers that feed our souls in such wonderful ways. We love you so much. And we pray that every day that our light would shine and that our mouth would be uh, quick to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we can. And that you would bless our families, Lord. Watch over our children as they're in school or as they're working or maybe their hearts are far away uh, in that far country. You know where they are. And we pray that you would touch their hearts, Lord, and bring them back. And the last thing we want to do is thank you for these wonderful rivers that you have provided for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I pray you have a good week and I'll see you next week.